All right, welcome back to uh, Project Synchro Podcast. Uh, I'm Ron. I'm Kyle. And this is uh, Mike and Ann. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hi. Uh, so Mike is a good friend of mine from uh, college. We lived together for a while or lived down, uh, down the hall from me at first in the dorms, and then we lived in a sketchy duplex outside of uh, beautiful Rolla, Missouri. Uh, Mike went on to uh, join Tesla for a while, and then, uh, Ann, you've worked at Tesla, and you left and went to uh, SpaceX, and you, your, your boss is an astronaut, which is the coolest thing ever, even though you hate your job. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, Mike, all right, so, Mike, you quit. I don't work anymore. Yeah, so why not? Um, I, I want to start by uh, talking about what, well, I... You can go into as much detail or choose not to even talk about Tesla at all. Oh, yeah, I'm I, can't, sure. I can't. I probably can't even mention any of it, to be honest. Okay. Like, I, I, I signed way too many papers that yeah. say, I, like, I'm not allowed to. But you did actual chassis <laughs> yes. design. So, yeah, I, I can talk about what I worked on, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, Give us a little rundown on that so everybody knows what's yeah, going on. Yeah, so I, I worked on, I designed, uh, uh, I was a senior chassis uh, specialist. Uh, or a senior chassis engineer, not really a specialist, um, uh, but I was in charge of large, large amounts of uh, of what makes the car go down the road on all four tires, hopefully straight, yeah, uh, and and handle reasonably well. Um, so yeah, I was a, uh, in, in charge of of, of safety structures, uh, subframe structures, all aluminum uh, uh, chassis components. Uh, did a lot of bushing uh, work, uh, suspension bushings, all the math and all the loading for what makes the car durable. So all the uh, all the FE finite element uh, analysis of uh, big structures like the subframes, control arms, knuckles, uh, wheels, uh, bearings, uh, and also powertrain uh, uh, durability and and initial design for things like half shafts, uh, differentials, gear case. Uh, some gear case design and uh, the mounting of of the electric motors. Or now, did you work on S? Yeah, or both. Okay, both cars. You worked so on Roadster model. and I did not. No, I didn't work no, on the Roadster. Roadster was already out. Yeah, it was a. Yeah, that was that was f- f- a little bit before I got there. But I worked there for five years, and so. But that's over now. And now I uh, now I'm an independent uh, independent consultant. Yeah, I work so, on uh, I work on various small projects. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the bike at all? Because I think... Yeah, well, yeah. I've gotten a lot of... We've heard a lot of people, like, see the Supermoto in the background and and various other bikes. So so most people in Project Synchro are are motorcycle-friendly at all. I thought your your bike project is... is Yeah, I've I've always liked bikes, and and I started a project, uh, God, about three years ago now. Started researching a project because I wanted to do an ultimate bike project. Uh, yeah, I had a Supermoto as well. I had a DRZ Supermoto uh, Suzuki 400, nothing special. Um, and then I have a, uh, I still have an MV Agusta F4 uh, Superbike. Uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to build something. You know, I wanted to actually I had a garage. I wanted to build a, a, a bike from scratch. Uh, so I decided to do a two-stroke. Yeah, because uh, why, uh, why not? Because why not? Uh, that's, that's what I've always loved. And I loved, uh, like 1980s two stroke GP bikes. Yeah. Well, there are, they weren't, they weren't called RCs. They were called, uh, NSRs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, NS and NSR Hondas. Yeah. And I loved those bikes. Uh, so I wanted to build, I wanted to build a two stroke, um, went down the path of looking for RG, like RGV, uh, you know, V fours uh, yeah. or TG TGR TGR Yamaha TGR TGV two uh, V twins. All that's so ridiculously expensive yeah. to import, just ridiculously expensive. So wound up uh, basing it around a CR five hundred thumper again. Why not? Which is yeah, and people tell me I'm crazy because they're like, oh, you can't you can't use you know that that large of a, a single piston in a in a track bike, it's just going to shake itself to pieces. You're not going to be able to ride it. And I don't really care what they, what <laughs> they say. So I'm building a, yeah, all aluminum frame. The frame is based on, I actually based it on an aluminum uh, CR frame, just 
the first generation 250 frame. Yeah. Lots of people do those swaps. Um, and the, the frame actually does work as a road bike frame. In fact, it's, it's, it's really damn similar to like a Honda Hawk frame or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, you know, the geometry is a little different, but it's super stiff. The first generation frame was actually too stiff for, for, for motocross. The people, people didn't really like the aluminum frame bikes when they came out because it was just, it was built like a road bike mm-hmm. and it was way too stiff, uh, and, and didn't flex like a motocross bike and too heavy. Uh, but it's going to be perfect for a road bike. So I, I hacked it up. The geometry has got to change a little bit, um, and I gotta, you know, do a bunch of do a bunch of work on it, and it's getting a bunch of stuff cut out. Uh, and then the it's a a one piece monocoque uh, body tail body tank the whole you know cooling system. Yeah, talking about the cooling system. Well, I thought the cooling system idea was really cool yeah. The so the it, it's gonna run a the whole the whole idea is it's a one lap time attack bike. So it's it's you know it's it's, it's tire warmers on it doesn't have a st- on board starter or anything. Um, has to get it has to get bump started off of a, a little uh, like starter dyno. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, take your take your tire warmers off. You do one warm up lap, and you do one you you do one time attack lap, and then maybe one more, and then you come in. So it doesn't need a, a super huge cooling system or a fuel system. Uh, so it's going to have just a uh, 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 it's probably like a, a six inch by ten inch or six inch by well probably. 13 inch uh, radiator core. So that's like one side. One really. side of, yeah, a little more than one side of the normal motocross bike. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea is it's going to be ducted very, very efficiently. So it gets ducted up and through the frame and out uh, underneath uh, your seat. Um, and so the uh, you got a lot of high pressure air right at the front of the bike coming through the front forks. Uh, that goes straight into the duct where it diffuses out into the flat radiator, which is right under your crotch. And then that exits uh, and converges back into like the, the wake uh, behind the, uh, behind your ass and behind the tail, it's low pressure, which is anyway. a low pressure, which is essentially sucking the air through the core. Um, and this whole thing. And then the, the support structure, the duct and the support structure for it is coming off the frame. And that actually, it, it's like a carbon support structure doubles as the seat structure, and the the bodywork, so it's it's all one piece. So it's incredibly incredibly light. There's no extra metal supports. There's none of that, you know, no no extra nothing extra on the bike. The whole projected weight of the bike right now is um, my latest bomb is at like two hundred and about two hundred eighteen pounds. Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's like, uh, I, and I'm I'm trying to like keep it from getting too insane. I haven't spent tons of money yet on. Like I could go back, like for for instance, the uh, the head, um, uh, what do you call the uh, the the head tube, not the head tube, but uh, what goes in the head tube between the triple trees, oh, uh, steering oh, oh, steering yeah, yeah, steering yeah. tube, yes, uh, or the steering the steering spindle. Mm-hmm. It's steel right it's now. All stock. Yeah, it's yeah. steel. It's a uh, you know uh, to make that work it, it, in the in the bearings of the two hundred and fifty. Um, it's like a Suzuki. Uh, it's a Suzuki uh, 600 uh, R a Jixer uh, yeah. race bike front end, yeah. uh, and so like it's got that stem, that steering stem pressed out and pressed back in to mm-hmm. fit for a 250. Um, that steel right now, it could be titanium, um, and, and I have I have like a, a you know full CAD model uh, of all that, so I could just order one up from a, from a guy, you know, it's a simple lathe part with some yeah. tapping, but I just haven't done that because I'd have to go and press that back out and I don't have a press and all that kind of stuff. How but, much, how much horsepower are you saying? Oh, so yeah, this the 500. It's going to be, it, it's, since it's only going to be like a one lapper, I don't really care too much about longevity. Uh, so the, the ports are getting raised, the, uh, uh, which just shifts the power band up, uh, and, um, you know, the head's going to go for super high compression and it'll probably, I'll probably run, uh, a bit of nitromethane. Uh, so, cause I don't really, yeah, again, why not? It, yeah. It, it'll get hot and it'll just, you know, it'll, it'll melt pistons. But, um, then again, I'm designing it to where I'm hopefully going to be able to pull the head off in the bike, or I don't know if I can pull the head off in the bike, but I'm going to try and figure out how to make it to where I can swap the engine quickly. Or swap not the engine, but at least swap the top end quickly. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm aiming for 100 horsepower, which isn't a lot. Uh, I mean, the GP bikes of their day, the 500s, made 200 horsepower. Yeah. Um, but for a single it's cylinder, crazy. for it's a asinine. single, it's incre- Yeah. So 200 and 218, 215 pounds is what I'm hoping the bike's going to weigh. Um, Which my supermoto weighs 280, 290 pounds or more and makes just 15, I, I think it dyno to 59 horsepower or something. And uh, it's brisk for me. Yeah. I um, really just wanted a, a super Granted, you're a, you're, you're a street bike. Person yeah, it yeah. Is. It's not going to be super quick in a straight line. I just wanted something that's ridiculously light and mm-hmm. ridiculously like low inertia. Yeah. Uh, so that you know you, you can, it can change direction really quickly and just just be fun. Uh, just be fun to 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 have like something that's the perfect. I want to you know that kind of project where everything on it is done exactly the way you you look at it and think that well that's. That's it. That's exactly what it needs to do. There's no extra bracketry. There's no extra yeah. janky. Oh, I had to route it this way because I didn't have the you know right now. It's yeah. it's just perfectly <clears throat> purpose purpose built like a, like a like a like a Porsche 911 or you know yeah. like the car behind you. No, or like the yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. No, that's some people say that and they're like, oh man, you're spe- <laughs> you're carrying too much on stuff and it's too you know. You, well, first of all, most of those people haven't seen it in person to see how terrible the pain is and. <laughs> how much stuff got scraped off of it or Mike and I this morning were beating beating the gutters rain gutters on with hammers so no it's not whenever people tell me I'm I'm being too retentive you got to point at projects like that where everything's in in CAD and what you know I haven't done I've done very very little CAD work and it's really just where I'm trying to get an idea of how something goes before I you know and most of the time most of the time it's cardboard honestly because <laughs> it's you know, I'm not building it to some crazy weight standard or whatnot. Um, so sort of to segue back into reality, you also built a, a 914. Into, yeah. And wh- where, uh, uh, what uh, sanctioning body or what? That was, and, and it, it was run in Chump Car. Yeah. Um, uh, now you they've, can't. They've, they've changed the rules specifically because of us and another team, I think. They were getting really worried but yeah, that very similar to this project here. The same level of preparation went into that car as as this car here. Uh, it was a 1972 uh, Porsche 914 that we literally bought in California from a guy. It was a barn, a barn, a true barn find. 180 dollars complete. Uh, the interior <laughs> was junk. That's so cheap. Uh, interior is junk. It had four four layers of paint on it. Uh, interior was absolutely trash because it had been sitting out in the rain for about 10 years. Uh, no rust other than like one or two little spots where water had pooled in the battery <laughs> box, which they all do. Yeah. Uh, no rust anywhere on the car. Uh, absolutely <laughs> complete suspension. Uh, com- a complete engine uh, with some fuel in- from some of the fuel injection. The old, it had a... Oh God, what was it? Sis. Bosch... No, it wasn't cis. It oh, wasn't. It wasn't um, cis. It was actually Motronic yeah. fuel injection. The very first computerized Motronic fuel injection. Oh wow! Uh, analog computer, yeah. an actual analog computer. Uh, so some of that was missing. We were <laughs> in the engine, like uh, somebody had taken off the intake and left it. Yeah, and so water, it water had poured in and seized it, and and so at first we were going to rebuild the engine. Uh, and we realized we were in over our heads because even though we got the car for $180, uh, Porsche parts, Porsche yeah. engine parts for Type 4s were, was just ridiculous. We could not believe. We were looking at spending, you know, thirty eight hundred four grand to rebuild a 2-liter. <laughs> and and we were just like, no way, because we're going to blow it up anyways because we're, you know, miss a shift or some, do something stupid. Uh, so I'm literally on Craigslist, and we, you know, six months later, we're, we're still stripping the car, putting a cage in it and stuff, but we didn't know what we were going to do. On Craigslist, fi- and I'm just typing in, like, Porsche 914 parts, you know, trying to find mm-hmm. it. We needed a door. We needed a hood because um, there was some, there was a, you know, the body was straight, but it had some dents and some shit. And we find a guy selling a small block Chevy. Uh, he, he said it was a 350. He didn't know. He said he thought it was a 350 small block Chevy, 
already bolted with the adapter and the clutch adapted and everything to a Porsche 901-914 transmission for $500. (laughs) Out in the middle of nowhere. And I I thought it was too good to be true. And no, but it wasn't. It was a fully running, perfectly fine motor. The guy had pulled it out of another 914 that had the swap done. Yeah. That he was putting a a aluminum block engine in. So this was a, a, a... And he didn't know what it was. So we bought it, just pulled up of a trailer, said, yeah, we'll take it. And we got it back to our house. It was a 1969 uh, Corvette. uh, 327. 327. Yeah. Um, We looked up the note. The guy didn't know that, though. He thought he he told us, he's like, yeah, I think it's out of an 80s van. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) no, 327 Corvette motor. Uh, We took it apart. It had uh, forged pistons. (laughs) It had valve springs upgraded. Um, didn't have a, a you know a, a hot cam or anything in it, and it had an absolutely shit carburetor on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the guy just wasn't and points ignition. So yeah. The guy just didn't have it tuned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we built the car around that. This car was the the it was built to the rules, to the chump car rules, one hundred percent. But it was the most cheater car you could possibly like within the, you know, absolutely to the limit of all the rules. It well, was, it was basically, a tube car. it was basically a tube frame. It was basically a tube frame. We had cut sections out and, you know, welded in all these tubes, um, the whole design of the car. So that was all in CAD too. I 3d scanned the chassis. So we stripped, <laughs> we stripped down that we were the only people in chump car that, you know, comes close to this. So the other people are actually building, you know, shit in their garage. Well, I, I, I stripped the car down to the bare tub. We flipped the tub over all the unnecessary brackets. Everything was cut down to bare metal. I 3d scanned the body designed a, a tube frame, basically a tube frame uh, uh, roll cage that was everything was perfectly triangulated back to the suspension points. Uh, we did keep the trailing arm rear suspension, but that was all boxed in and like, you know, reinforced. Yeah. Um, uh, the struts, you know, perfectly tied into the cage, front and rear. Um, and then the suspension was uh, the... Because we're not, you know, you're not allowed to spend money on on extra parts. You can only replace with OEM mm-hmm. bushings and stuff. Um, well, we made our own bushings that were stiffer but looked stock, mm-hmm. uh, and then we didn't get caught on those. And then the springs, because that car has no, it has torsion bar front, and there's no good way to increase the spring rate. We basically readjusted all the bars, and it sits down on bump rubbers. <laughs> and we did we. We did the, all the math. We had, you know, Instron machines and, and testing machines that work to get uh, rate curves to get our wheel rate. So we, we knew exactly what kind of bump rubbers we needed to use uh, all the way around and, and packers like they do in NASCAR yeah. to get the rates right. So this car was essentially a locked out <laughs> go-kart uh, with, with uh, a straps. A small block on, with, on, yeah, on yeah. Uh, bump stops. Uh, yeah, it was a small <laughs> block with a seat strap to it and a 914 body kind of tacked back over it. Um, and we got it run. We set the car down on the, on the ground and, um, I remember we put it on the scales for the first time and it weighed, I think it was 2,048 pounds. And this is a car with, you know, 300 pound feet of torque and potentially 300 horsepower on tap when, when things were running right, uh, running up against like MR2s yeah. with blown head gaskets. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and uh, and Toyota Cressidas, you yeah. know, yeah. And uh, so we they I ran it once. Uh, we ran it at Las Vegas. Uh, ended up having some problems. We smoked the clutch we got for it. We put a new clutch in it, and the clutch ate shit after uh, after about eight hours. Um, and that was that was a, a manufacturing defect in the clutch. It was not because we were driving it shitty. It was just the half one half of the clutch just sheared. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so that kind of bummed us out. They went on to run it recently at Laguna. I don't run with those guys anymore. They, since I left, uh, left that job, I moved back to LA and don't keep in touch with them, but they still run the car and they just recently set a, uh, they got a guy in the car and he, uh, you know, he, he never, they took it to Laguna Sega. I don't think they'd ever driven the, the car at Laguna before. <coughs> and this guy specifically had never driven the car on Laguna anywheres. And, uh, if I remember seeing the video correctly, it was, they ran like a one, 
it was like a 146 Jesus. or 147 at Laguna. <laughs> Laguna? Yeah, it was, it, whatever it was, whatever the time was, <laughs> it was almost two seconds faster than a 2016 Mazda MX Cup car. <laughs> <laughs> was it like and this thing's on yeah and fast. this thing's on this thing's on street tire it's on like 180 treadwear bfgs it's not <laughs> not even on slicks or anything and we literally built this car for uh probably about four thousand dollars <laughs> in my garage and that's how that's how you do it it's like just not being an idiot and not uh yeah. not starting with a, a piece of shit toyota cressida and carrying <laughs> carrying just Ten to fifteen percent more on each part. Oh yeah. Oh, it took it took us two almost two and a half years from the time we bought the car until it got on track because everything we did was just we didn't spend tons just like you're doing here. Didn't spend tons of money. Yeah. Just thought about shit. Yeah. And like we we took the long road on a lot of parts, mm-hmm. so we wouldn't have to spend tons of money or wouldn't have to compromise. Yeah. So like the brake system, for instance, the original stock 914 has the wimpiest uh, solid front rotors, and it's the kind of rotor where it's an uh, integrated rotor wheel bearing on a spindle. It's like a truck. Yeah, absolute <laughs> trash. And uh, we knew that we'd cook those. We'd, Immediately. We'd cook those. Great calipers, beautiful Porsche calipers, but just shit rotors. Um, so we wound up got some massive Volvo 242 four-piston fixed calipers yeah. on the front uh, and some vented discs that I believe were designed for a Spec Racer Ford mm-hmm. or a, a Formula 2000 Continental. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really cheap, uh, di- just the disc, right? So yeah. they're meant for aluminum hat two-piece. So what did you do? Just turn the rotor down? You took the and, rotor. And, and, and yeah. threaded... No one had ever done this before. Fuck oh, I come on. That's I couldn't so straightforward. Believe, I couldn't believe no one had done this before. We actually thought about making these as kits and selling them because everybody with 914 says the same dilemma. They want to track yeah. the car, but they toast the brakes. Yeah, and just so what, turn the rotor down what, into a flange. What every, yeah, what everybody does <laughs> is they always upgrade to the five lug Porsche parts, which are retardedly oh, expensive. expensive. Yeah. You know, it's like $3,000 a car because you got to get the, you got to change your wheels too. Yeah to 911 wheels. And we, we knew we couldn't afford to do that. We knew that they'd, they'd kill us on that. So we stuck with the four lug, and it's four by 130, by the way, the dumbest bull pattern. Most uh, Porsches are five, but Porsches already are weird, five by 130. They're the only ones who do that. Or, uh, or the or uh, four five on five. Or five. Yeah. So we had four by 130. Couldn't, you know, had to get custom wheels made uh, to fit these. I didn't even know they had four by 130. Yeah, it's the biggest four there is. I mean, yeah. What is the, uh, what are the bugs? Five bugs on are five, five, on five or, or a wide five, yeah. which is like yeah. five by, hell, I don't even big. That's what, that's what Mark and John, huge. Mark and John run a, run a wide five, and it's, you know, the it flange. Bolts to, it bolts to the, the brake, you Basically, know, yeah. the, the whatever, yeah. You know, the, uh, the, you know Kendall's tire <coughs> tire mounter. Yeah, it almost the you know the big flange thing. The a wheel almost goes around that. Yeah, wow, it's ridiculous. Like yeah. you come off of the barrel, and you've got about this far before you're in the in the flange. You know. Yeah, we we took They're the really we took the original rotors, which have the 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 rotor and hub, and we machined it down on a on a, a, a CNC or a, just a, a bridge port to where it's just a hub. So mm-hmm. now we have just a hub and no rotor. And then we made a uh, an adapter, which was made out of some ridiculous. You know, Craig went to a junkyard and got some not a junkyard, a metal a metal supply place, and scored some uh, some of the strongest, craziest stainless steel I'd ever I'd ever heard of. It was like fifteen five stainless. It had a you know a yield strength of like fifteen hundred megapascals, mm-hmm. um, one point five gigapascals, and it was um, he got it real cheap. And so he's like, hey, can you design some hats out of this? And I'm like, sure. So we designed these hats where the studs go through the hats, through the backside, back out through the, the hub. And that's what the wheel bolts on. Mm-hmm. So the, the same studs that hold the whole, wheel on. It's one single stud. Hold the hat on, yeah. yeah. So you got four hat, four bolts holding that on. And then this spider's out to pick up, I think it was eight of these little uh, 5 sixteenths bolts that bolt the rotor to that. Gotcha. These rotors. So the rule about it was, again, we're, this is a huge brake upgrade, and usually <laughs> we get dinged for that. Mm-hmm. But they have a rule. The rule is you can replace brake components as long as the components that you're replacing them with don't cost more than it was twice the OEM cost. 
the OEM cost for those rotors oh god was yeah, sure. uh, like sixty bucks each yeah. or eighty bucks each for Porsche rotors yeah um, the rotors the floating rotors from Willwood they were Willwood floaters were only like thirty two dollars. Dirt and track. so and so Freaking. the C and, and so we CNC this sculpted out uh, hat, uh, and I, I go back and I, I have screenshots of of FEA iterations trying yeah. to make it as lightweight as possible. Uh, you know, again, who's who's designing chump cars with like iterative iterative mm-hmm. nonlinear thermal CAE and shit to to figure out <laughs> make sure like we wouldn't overstretch no the bolts when it got hot. I did a way too much math on this, and uh, and bolted it all together. And uh, yeah, the car has brakes like a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Ridiculous. Um, but yeah, L- that. So again, reasons like that is why it took forever. But it was worth it in the end to watch that car just dominate yeah. all. And uh, now they've changed the rules, and they're not allowed to run in the uh, <coughs> in the normal jump car anymore. They can only run in the exhibition, exhibition. <laughs> which is unfortunate. But that's nuts. Whatever. It was worth doing. So that's you, and then meanwhile, Anne, uh, Anne, you work in crew systems for SpaceX, right? Yeah. And and what what all does that entail? So this is one of many of dream jobs that I would have. Yeah, and it's it's someone one of mine too. I mean, I always wanted to work in space. I actually, wanted to be working in astronomy when I was a kid, <laughs> but I made a ten years detour into automotive when I work in occupant package and then occupant safety. And so occupant safety led me to working on uh, crew safety at SpaceX. 15 years, there's been tons of work on... It, it, I almost want to say more so IndyCar than F1, even uh, with the simulation predicting injury, uh, because I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. Um, 2004 was Greg... Uh, Greg, Moore. Greg Moore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was like the highest speed incident ever. And after he died, they were like, we got to, like, go back and, you know, figure out how to make these. You was know. that a catch fence wreck? No, no, no. Or was that <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, yeah, sort of. Yeah. He came across because the field. And, yeah. He came across the field and, sp- and then hit and just spun like mad. Yeah. That was the one where they had way too many cars on the track. Yeah, it was way too many cars. And, like, the, the damn speeds were in the, I want to say that yeah, was. They were high. Yeah, that really was high. that was it was a California, right? Mm, uh, California uh, or Vegas. Uh, California or Vegas. I know that year at California I think it was, was when Vegas they were finish. running like 262 in qualifying. Yeah, it was cool. insane. Yeah, so they went back and, and a lot of the, the simulation with IndyCar was trying to figure out cuz uh Delaro was going to be redesigning the tubs anyways, right? Uh and a lot of the simulation was focused on trying to figure out what is the best angle to have someone's feet femurs and back and like what shape your back needs to conform to because if you're going to read the whole tub is built around your back essentially Mm -hmm. your back and your your feet your you know positioning of your feet um in an f1 car uh your your toes and your your legs are parallel to the ground and about at the (laughs) level of your just below the level of your eyes indycar is almost that high too now um but um yeah, they you know so tons of simulation on like them you know moving moving the back trying to figure out and everything, and uh, someone someone that she used to work with and someone that I know uh, who went to Rala I won't say her name but <laughs> she she uh, this woman actually worked on simulating uh, uh, simulating spinal injury mm-hmm. uh, and G loads on on you know neck and spine from indie car accidents and. Um, Trying to remember the name of the driver, not Scott Dixon. Uh, da, 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 da. He died. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name now, but another IndyCar driver who How died. How long ago? This would have been 2006 ish, 2007. Uh, IndyCar driver who died. The guy, um, uh, uh, she was doing a study and. It was where they took a, they took a car and they had them full geared up, and they put the car in a uh, in a giant X ray, and they X rayed him and the car, mm. uh, so that they could get a uh, a profile of the bones in, in uh, you know how they fit up against the seat in the padding of the seat and everything, mm. 
And so that's really important for like, yeah, laying out the simulation of the bone. So, you know, like the dummy in CAE is positioned exactly as it is in the car, which is really hard to do if you're just looking at the outside of the car and how Mm -hmm. the person's sitting in it. And, uh, she said, uh, yeah, it was like two weeks after her, uh, thesis. It was her, I think it was part of her PhD thesis. It was was modeling this stuff. Um, the guy dies in a wreck. That was almost exactly the kind of impact, That's like great. off-axis impact that like they were trying to simulate. I can't remember the name of the driver now, um, but yeah, it was uh, Tracy. No, not Tracy. Tracy didn't die. He's still alive. No, I can't remember the name. But anyways, yeah, cra- um, crazy, crazy shit that they go through. Well, because there was like the after Greg Moore died, there was the same like level of like importance on safety is the same as like for, for Indy cars, like it was with F1 when yeah. Brandon Senna died. Yeah. Like it was like crazy, like, okay, we're going to figure this shit out. Yeah. You know, and now it's, it's, it's incredible how, how, but there's still shit, uh, like last year, uh, who was the guy that took, uh, almost bled out, uh, from, uh, oh, the leg injury. Uh, it was, yeah. uh, 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 Hinchcliffe. Starving H, know. but uh, yeah, you know, goes into the wall and uh, p- part of the control arm or something went through the tub, and the mount oh, wow. goes straight into his his leg. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, like, you know, he looks fine from the outside. It wasn't even that bad of an accident. And everything. He's sitting in the tub, and you know, Bleed. hit, bleeding out, and the artery is busted. And um, they said it was like, yeah, it was you know, the, the first responders, you know, guys having flashbacks to. Uh, Zanardi's accident mm-hmm. where you know was, the tub was whole just fr- whole gone, thing just you know? sheer yeah and uh yeah, that's yeah really so bad. in any car the speeds are the speeds are lower now than they used to be but shit still happens but the cars are st- <coughs> so safe i mean they're still hitting around 240 at, at, <laughs> i think though yeah 500 Two, 230 238 yeah or something like that, but but there's it's so ridiculous how safe some of the tubs are, or, or all the tubs are, you know, all the same. But you know, you can go into a wall, not dead on, but you can you can hit a wall at a 35 degree angle at 200 and walk away. And the, the fact that this is you know even possible, yeah, is crazy. It's it's the level is that they've gotten to, and F1 is is, I mean, they, well, they did have you know the first driver since Senna died last year, Bianchi. Yeah. With his accident, but that was just a freak, you know, bad, yeah. bad timing, bad situation. Yeah, but now you have the halo. Yeah, they're making <sighs> improvement on the head yeah. for that, so. which look crazy. But they say they're really not that bad so far. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you'd notice it driving the car because you rarely look straight ahead right. when you're driving that kind of car. So. Have you seen these, Ron? No. The halo. Oh, okay. it's, it's basically a loop that comes up. And then it comes straight down. It's, a ca- it's like a carbon it. fiber, but it like comes down to a fine. Well, point. why is it even open cockpit at this point? Right, right, yeah. Like, well, the so they say oh. they say that the 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 halo would be cheaper and easier to implement than uh, a what? canopy. What well, saying easier to get out of? <laughs> yeah, too. and easier to get uh, out of. Okay, yeah. that's I'll buy that because but it's because they can do explosive bolts on it. Yeah, I think you can even get out of it. It looked like the part over your head, you could like reach up there's and like latches jump on out. It, yeah. But they have explosive bolts too. So if it goes to where like if it gets stuck in a thing, they can either push a button on the wheel or it can even do it <laughs> remotely. Huh. Uh, it can be done from the pits and but they like, can explode it off. Yeah, it, it just seems to me like I don't know, like Bianchi's crash. Like he I don't but know. But the halo is not because of Bianchi. It's bef- because of the other accident uh, the other where, one, they, uh, where they the got Indy shit car. from the tracks coming, yeah, last coming year, at their head the and other, almost the, die. The other Indy car guy that died last year, uh, not Weldon, but uh, shit, now I can't, I, I've forgotten all these guys' names already. Yeah. The, but yeah, he got hit by a, uh, a another car. Or I think, no, it was, another, it was a wing. It was a wing. Yeah, debris yeah. from It was like car. a front wing that flipped up, came down, and hit him straight in the helmet, <laughs> doing like, you know, a hundred miles an hour speed differential, and the part weighs like twenty pounds. Yeah, it's your helmet's not going to help. So yeah, that's what the the who, who was it that hit the uh, hit the uh, recovery? <coughs> that was Bianchi. That was that was, that was, that Bianchi. was Bianchi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was the one who went under the. That was so what, stupid. Well, submarine they under. Have been out there that was the car. So is the thing. Well, there was cars yeah. on track. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, that's not a that's not a manufacturing <laughs> issue. That's no, a that's a no. that's a procedural. Yeah, that was the Japanese crew. That was, yeah. that was Japan, wasn't it? That was yeah. Japan, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it was pouring down rain, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And he slid because that that car wrecked, and he did the exact same, yeah, same thing. thing yeah, that the car exactly. did. Yeah. Yeah, that's always that's always the thing. Like whenever they're recovering cars, you know, rally stages, anything. Like yeah. if one car there, made a mistake, there's gonna be there's gonna be a chance that ten other cars end up in yeah, exactly the same. They're gonna hole. do the same thing. So watch the f out. Yeah. Like yeah. people gonna be coming over a hill doing the same yeah. problem. I just kinda, can't believe that there's even there was road like the the guys were out there. Like because even if it wasn't him hitting the the front end motor. <laughs> yeah. If he was eight feet over, he would have hit a crew worker. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, that was, you know, yeah. I mean, you would have seen just carnage. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of uh, uh, disappointed that even in, in uh, U.S. rally that, uh, you know, we've had some pretty bad accidents and, a, and a, a few deaths, unfortunately. And every once in a while, you'll see a rule trickle out after a wreck like that. And you kind of can just work it backwards and, and see what happened. But um, it's almost a mystery, and I don't know if this is like uh, people don't want to really disclose exactly what happened, but um, very rarely when you have a, a fatal rally accident do you get to uh, really see any data from that. You know, because there, there either isn't any or you don't, you know, you, you want to see how the failure occurred and how the cage deformed and, you know... To, to think about if we need to yeah. do any changes or additions. That's a good example. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, you don't see that a whole lot. Um, you just kind of have to take uh, FIA 253J for what it is and build a cage to it and, and just trust that whatever work went into uh, defining that standard is good enough, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the but actual... But is that lack of transparency or it's just lack of data? Because in IndyCar and F1, the seat are instrumented with accelerometer, the driver it's, are wearing... It's both. Yeah, the cars, the cars have no... The cars have nothing other than cameras, yeah. right? So yeah. it's harder to... Yeah. So there's no... There's, there's, there's no... Well, there are accelerometers, but they wouldn't... They, they're not impact accelerometers. Yeah, so they're, they're not going to go over a couple G. And uh, yeah, I mean, as far as cage deformation and everything... I. It would it would be interesting to to see. I I highly suspect that that properly built like all modern you know cars that are competing in Rally America or any any proper any proper series where they're they're looking at the cages mm-hmm. with scrutiny instead of just you know like not like lemons or or whatever where they just let any stick welded piece of shit come through. But yeah. proper cages, um, there's probably no failures in the in the actual cage area. Mm-hmm. That, that leads to injury. It, it, it's all likely due to foreign object intrusion. That's the other thing I was going to say is, you know, you still have a really, really big window opening yeah. and you're still going to get stuff coming through the window and the side window if you don't or, have or, or the floor pans. Even. Yeah, exactly. The floor pans are very, very thin metal that will rip open like a tin can. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yeah, the, the most vulnerable part of any safety cage car with modern, modern, Cross bracing and full X braces and everything, it's going to be the wheel, the wheel housing. Yeah, because the the sheet metal around the wheelhouse, there's the crash rail uh, mm. that that goes inboard somewhat, but the outboard sheet metal is. I think it's still just punch through it. Yeah, any, anything can it's punch a, through it. And you same. have you have your cage leg there. You have yeah. one cage leg there, but that one cage leg has nothing around it of mm-hmm. of, of anything. So you I mean you experience this somewhat in your Civic? Yeah. Well, when, I also <laughs> experienced this at Pikes Peak. Right. Yeah, uh, the wheel comes through. Our 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 wreck are off at Pikes Peak. I there's you know, you do you laugh, but there's the you do the invisible brake pedal thing right. when you're Put on your, the passenger yeah. side mm. and you brace and there is a very, very defined set of footprints <laughs> with the with the floor pan bent around it. Yeah. And the scar. <laughs> it was it was a little worrisome. But yeah, it's uh uh that's you know, totally true that uh the the crashes the crashes that worry me the most are not are definitely not rolls because the pedestrian would think, you know, you see you see someone rolling and you're like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. It's shedding part, but <coughs> but no, you're dissipating energy as you're rolling and it's not a hard stop. But like, and especially you know, even crashes like center punching trees and and you know popping a tree sideways and getting thrown around or something, those are bad. But the ones that really really worry me are stumps. Yeah, stumps and big rocks where you catch it in the sill bar, and it's right, you know, somewhere around the uh, uh, the base, you know, and it, it could possibly come in and get you. Yeah, and that's why that's why having that. I mean, you have a bar, right? I have down uh, on the sill bar. I have 
a really low sill bar, and the sill bar is, is integrated in with the seat mounts. Right. Um, I have, um, I even have, let's see, so, so I have the door cross that's a flattened door cross with gussets across it, so I, don't actually, I, I never actually cut the tubes mm-hmm. in the X bar. Um, the X's are as tall as, as I think I can get away with. It's like half the, I can do half the door opening and they're half the door opening, or they start at half the door opening. Um, I could have done them asymmetrical so that it was higher. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, only other, uh, the only other is like the NASCAR yeah, bars. Yeah, the NASCAR bars. But, tube, yeah. tube, 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 but that's, um, that's, that's a lot. So that X, you know, I'm, <coughs> that's a, a decent, decent enough for side impact, but it's, you're, you're going to put that in, uh, you're going to put the main hoop. If you get a side impact and it wants to come in, put the main hoop yeah. in tension. So I have a bar behind that that matches, <laughs> ma- matches the top door bar node that runs back to the suspension. So, so uh, you're going to have roll down windows, right? So this, this yeah, isn't, initially, yeah. yeah. The, the, the thing I, I, I've done, for, we did it for the 914, I've done it on a couple other cars to design cages for us, is I tell people, like time attack cars mm-hmm. uh, or, or any, any cars where you're, you know you don't need roll down windows mm-hmm. uh, or you just have window nets, you don't have, you don't have plexi or, or glass at all, is, is cut, you don't need a door skin, you don't need a door bar. You should have all that completely hollow and get the bars as far away from... Because that's the other thing is the cages aren't... You're not going to pop the cage. You're not going to break the cage. Even if it's a welded X, it's not going to... Mm-hmm. You know, good welds aren't going to break at the welds. But if you just have a flat door X on your side, uh, that in a really high-speed tree, that's going to come in six, seven inches. Oh, mine are... It's very, it's very minute. Outwards, they're yeah. very. They they are outwards by only if you look at the plane between the half where the half lateral and the and the main hoop are. They're maybe only yeah. out by an inch. Clocked the X's. Yeah, X bars are clocked. If you if you outwards. don't have windows, you can push it all the way out to the outside of the door skin, and that yeah. gives you an extra like six inches of intrusion yeah. protection. Now, if I wanted to do, tree. if I wanted to remove the door skin, um, I would have had to use this. Um, some kind of like carbon. Sh- there, there was some standard for FIA standard for what that door protective material had to be. Uh, if I took that stuff out and I ditched the door bar, <laughs> and I looked it up and it was expensive, so I didn't do it. So <laughs> that's they require you to keep the door skin and they they require you to put a covering that's over interesting. it. Yeah. Do they require the the sill bar now at the bottom? Um. If if. FIA 253 doesn't require it, you don't have to have it. And I know it's option I know it's an optional bar, but I don't I think it is required now. I, I uh, was gonna say I know I know recently like SCCA and NASA rules did not require it. Yeah. And I'm really, really surprised. I should it, know this because I the, I just got my scrutineer's it's license. The easiest, <laughs> it's the but I have easiest to look at the bar. Sheet. It's the easiest bar to weld in the cage, and there's no reason that car shouldn't have it because the actual sill strength of a lot of older cars, modern cars that have to pass IHS pull tests yeah. are going to be brick shit houses down there. Yeah. But something like this, what most people are going to be racing, something in the eighties, it's two uh, pieces of sheet metal. Yeah, two That's pieces it. of one point, and they're like six millimeter. You know, oh, no, mild no. steel, not even, yeah. not even a you know higher strengths or anything. It's like eighteen gauge or something. Yeah. It's <laughs> terrible. So, uh, yeah, mine is. Uh, I actually welded both of my foot plates. Uh, welded the sill bar in around the foot plates and then put the whole piece in the car so that I right. could go know, around it. Full weld around it. Um, so, did you guys have anything else? I think we're about at about an hour or yeah, so now. Yeah, about 50 minutes, something like that. Okay. So the safety safety uh, design one. It's a little morbid to think about all this stuff, but it is no, really it's, no, important. It's no, it's, it's, it's important. worth it's <laughs> worth planning for and worth like lo- worth looking over everything as you as you do it. That's why, like, yeah, the people who just throw cages in a car and just kind of go out there and rally, like, well, a, you know. Well, it's one thing. It's it's kind For me, it's kind of one thing in a single-seat vehicle because if I build it, I'm in it. And right. I'm racing it. Yeah. But if I build a, a two-seat yeah. rally car... Yeah, if you're going to have somebody I, with I, it. Yeah. So, someone is entrusting their life to, to what I've built. Um, and you can kind of think of it both ways. You can kind of think of it like, do I trust myself to... Uh, build a cage that myself and uh, a friend can get in and 
not die? Or do I trust someone else to build a cage that's good enough for myself and a friend to get in and not die? You know, so it, it kind of goes both ways. And um, I personally did not, although there are many professionals around, and I, you know, the one uh, Scott Rhea in St. Louis, I totally do trust. It still it bothered me a little bit, and it was something I wanted to do myself so that I knew exactly how it was done. It's a good experience. And it's, it is, it's, good, yeah. it's good skill. It's a good skill, skill set to have. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, it, next time, it, you know, every, every car you build after this one, it'll go 10 times quicker. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, uh, thanks guys for listening and thank you two for joining us and, uh, uh, stay tuned to project synchro. We're going to ha- hopefully have a video up either just before, or just after this podcast. Um, and we haven't told Kyle about this. Anne has an old uh, Buran shuttle tile that we're going to. Uh, that? Yeah. The That's internet. The internet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to take a blowtorch to it and have some fun. That is awesome. Yeah, I know. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.